Hi, everybody. Hi, Barry. Hi, Barry. Hello. Hi, Barry. All right, so today, um, Evan Lee is going to be our speaker. He teaches at the University of Tennessee and um, is one of the co-founders of the Glitch Festival. Yes. And uh, he'll talk to us today about his work. So everybody, welcome, Evan. <laughs> Hey everybody. Um, so I'm totally interested in, in screwing up things for purpose. Um, I, I think that that's the kind of work I'm interested in making. And, and before I started making glitch work, I think I was interested in that and just didn't have a good way to express it. Um, I, I come from a filmmaking background, um, and my first couple of films were mostly documentaries about social things that were uh, screwy. Uh, like, <clears throat> in 2007, I made this film uh, about a guy named Frank Olson, uh, who was killed in, by the CIA in uh, the 50s. And I was like, oh, that's a, that's a thing that is gone but not forgotten. Um, and then one day, I was watching uh, totally legally acquired television from a hard drive. Uh, with a friend of mine during uh, a thunderstorm in Ithaca, New York, and um, we had this professor that we kind of both really respected. He's an artist, uh, he won the Guggenheim a couple of years back, uh, a guy named David Gatton. And what David would do would take film, like film strips, and he would scratch on it. And he would make films out of the, this film medium that we normally take to be representational, but he was actually working with it almost like sculpture or drawing. Um, and so we were thinking, you know, like, there's got to be a way to do that with video. Like, there's got to be a way that video is physical. Um, and literally, like, in that moment, there was a power hit, and everything went off, but the, the laptop was still trying to pull information from this drive that was spinning down. And everything went crazy. Um, and it was like one of those, like, oh, that's what we should be doing moments. Uh, <laughs> So after that, um, I got really interested in file architecture and how like files are created and how like really really fundamentally when you export as a JPEG or when you export as like a GIF, even though they look the same, those files are really different. Uh, have you guys have you guys done any hacking or glitching in this class at all? A little bit with photos. A little bit with photos. Okay. I mean, you, you can tell like you know. Pictures that look the same are not the same when they break apart, and it's only when you break them apart that you can figure this out. Um, so this is like, and I, I normally don't go so autobiographical on this. I don't, I don't talk about myself. Right. I'm not very interesting. Um, so like, so okay, so that happened, and I was like, okay, this is what I should be doing. Um, but I think that artists who just work on technical things. Um, and, and like, don't really move beyond that. I, th I think I find a lot of problems with that. Like, I or rather, like, I can't do that. I need to figure out why I'm doing it. And a lot of times, like, I'll just do something until I figure out why I've been doing it for that long. Um, so, I was making all these glitches. When when you really think about it, a, a glitch is a really strange thing, um, especially like when when someone steps out to make it. Um, and, and at this time, like, a lot of people that I really loved were getting sick and dying. I just kept, you know, I was, like, you know, putting up, and I was, like, making these glitches, and I didn't totally know why. And I realized, like, it was, it was this weird sort of cybertronic, cybernetic therapy. Like, you know, life presents you with all these things, and eventually, you're like, those are going to alter, those are going to change, your body's going to change, your body's going to decay, and ultimately you're going to share in the two things that every human does. You're going to get born and you're going to die. And sometimes you die immediately after you're born, and sometimes you die when you're 110. Just, you know. um, so, so by controlling these glitches, or by putting these files in a, in a place where they could fall into peril and disrepair, I think what I was trying to show, and I, I think sort of where I am now with this, is that um, let me tell a ghost story. Uh, there's, a, there's a guy named Claude Shannon. Uh, Claude was a mathematician, and he, in 1946, he published this book called Mathematical Theory of Communication. And um, it's a really interesting article, because he's talking about transmitting information between two points. And he says that when you transmit data, you encode it, 
and you encode it so that it's small. I mean, you do this all the time. Like, you take big things to support so they're small so they can fit on YouTube because if you put your whole Final Cut timeline on YouTube, it'd just be too big. And he, he figured that there was a point that you get close and close and close to it, and then to cross that point, it wasn't compressed information anymore. It was just entry. It was chaos. Uh, you couldn't get data back. Um, so that point came from the Shetland's entropy, and there's an equation that you can use to figure it out, and it's actually the equation that all modern data compression is based on. Uh, so he published this, uh, this article in the Bell Labs journal, and it just turns out that one of the publishers was this woman, and he ended up marrying her, and they moved to MIT, and then Claude did a lot more work on this thing called the Shannon Weaver model, which was how we compress data, how we remember things, how we put it away. And then um, and then he developed our early onset Alzheimer's and died really quickly. And then in a letter that his wife wrote later, she said that um, she still hears his voice and it's coming from outside. So she'll like wake up in the middle of the night and go outside and open a door and try to listen and she can't. Um, and so for me, like hearing that story, it sort of catalyzed all of this. It was like, I was like, oh, that's what I'm trying to figure out, you know? Because everything on on your computer, like all this stuff, is going away. File, file architecture, as all things that we've invented, are, are is pretty. It's not perfect. Um, there's a lot of things that could happen to it beyond just physical damage. But like, there's a thing called data migration, which is like the frogs in Jurassic Park, like. They'll, a zero will just forget that it was a one and become a one. It's really, and this happens over a lifespan of about 80 years. Um, so if, if our data is failing, if our bodies are failing, um, and if, if there's a point of entropy for data, there has to be a point of entropy for us. And, and for me, that, that's, that's what happens when you die. Um, I, really, I really like ghost stories. Not because uh, I like getting scared. I actually don't see them as totally scary. I think they're actually kind of reassuring because, you know, uh, if, if you don't have a sort of religious regimentation for what happens after you die, ghosts kind of present a really interesting understanding for what happens, or at least something, you know? Um, so when I make a glitch and when I present it and I present that work, what I'm really showing or trying to show is that, you know, like, this file died, it's not useless, it's not gone. Um, in fact, in a lot of respects, it can be very, very beautiful. But sort of reconciling that thing that we are so tempted to do, you know, it's a glitch, it's a screw up, someone messed up, it's a problem, we got to fix it. And just back first in and saying, huh, that's really pretty, or that's really interesting, or that's a, that's a weird moment to have something glitched, you know? Um, so I think glitch, you know, not only does it show the system at work, like it shows the file architecture, but it also shows like the hope of continuation. Like there, there's this episode of Futurama where a nerd gets hurt and then it's one more Bex in it. Um, and he sings this song at the end and he's like, just because I'm broken doesn't mean I'm useless. And I'm like, yeah, that basically sums up like, just because I'm broken doesn't mean I'm useless. Um, so yeah, uh, so that's sort of how I fell into this. Uh, I mean, I, I guess, I, I don't know what you want to hear about. Like, I could talk about the safety cycle, I could talk about some new stuff that I'm doing, or I could talk more about the latest conference. Anything you want to talk about. I, I will talk about ghosts for the next 45 minutes. Um, okay, well, uh, um, also, if, if y'all have questions during this process, I totally like to be interrupted. Like, I think the, the whole, like, me talk for 40 minutes and then you ask questions for like 10, like that's a weird model. So if you have questions, raise your hand and just flat out interrupt me. Um, Cause I like being interrupted, obviously. Oh good, Sean's here. <laughs> yeah, I'll get you. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll ask the, uh, the, the young woman in glasses in the front, I can see you really well. If there's a question, just like, do this, and I'll, 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 I'll cut it. Um, okay, so uh, I was making these glitches, and a lot of people were dying, not to be a bummer, but it was what was happening. And uh, I was like, I was like, oh man, 
as, as with all artists, when I like Googled this, I didn't really find anything because this was like 2007, 2006, and there wasn't a lot out there. And I was like, I am a bad motherfucker. Like, no one's doing this. I, I, and of course, like that wasn't true. Um, but I thought I was I was alone, and I was making these glitch art pieces, and I was sort of like making these tests. Um, little did I realize that every art form goes through this. This is just, and I, I firmly believe this, that this is just new media's deconstructionist period. I mean, if you go back to like literary literature, like, I mean, James Joyce, total glitch artist. Total glitch artist. Just in literature. I mean, have any, has any of you tried to read Finnegan's Wake? That thing is impossible, but, but try it, it's really cool. <laughs> You know, he's, he's a glitch artist. Comedy? Uh, Charlie Kaufman. Um, Andy yeah, right, Charlie Kaufman? Andy Kaufman. Andy Kaufman. Okay. Yeah, he, total glitch artist. Total glitch artist. Um, you know, every, every medium has this. It's just, you know, John Cage, I'll, I'll fight to the death. He's a glitch artist. He's in our camp. But, um, you know, anyone that wants to show what their medium is actually about by refusing to do it correctly, I think falls in that. But, but so, so I thought I was like, oh, I'm a new media glitch artist. I'm, I'm new, I'm something special. I wasn't. Um, eventually I found a couple of people uh, that you, you names you might know. Uh, Nick Brees, John Cates, John Spatcher, and Rosa Menkman. Uh, and, and we sort of like all kind of gravitated. We were like Facebook friends, and we were sh sharing work with one another. And, and then you know, one summer, uh, in the summer of 2010, I, I had just gotten this job. I was in grad school at the time, and then I was like, I was like why don't we just do it? Why don't we run a festival? No one will come, but let's just do it. Um, so we, we put this out, this really super nebulous call for it. So it was like, you like breaking things? Give it to us. Like, we'll take it. So we had, like, we had people making like, videos, which workshops. We had this, uh, this amazing artist duo. Um, Jessica Westbrook and Adam Trowbridge, and they put on this performance where Jessica, who's a diabetic, ate an apple until like and just kept testing her blood on a projection screen so that like she was getting the point of entropy. It was and like I didn't know this as a as a curator, so I was sitting in the front row like, please don't die. I can't. I don't know what you hear. But the but the response from the community was like overwhelming. It was crazy. Like we had we had so many people. People flew in from other countries to like part of this, um, and it was really it was really great. But but then then we had this thing where like, oh crap! Like people are paying attention to us. We actually have to think about this a little bit. So this year for glitch, it became a lot more about like like how do you curate a glitch? It's, it's a weird thing, right? Like, how do you say that your screw-up is better than their screw-up? Like, it, it's a really, it's a thing that we're sort of wrestling with even still, and I, I think it's interesting to sort of develop metrics for that. Like, how do you develop, <laughs> your garbage is better than their garbage. I mean, it's all, it's all still garbage, but, but it's weird because you can look at pieces and say, like, this has a point of view, or this is, seems more like just a, a test. Um, and if any of you have good thoughts on that, I would be totally willing to hear them. Because <laughs> uh, I am lost in the fun. I'm not yeah, going to get in front of the camera, okay. but I can yell. Can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you great. Okay. I'd like you to elaborate on that if you can, um, about what you think is necessary for a glitch to really be art. Is it about intentionality? Is it because, you know, you could say, some of the crap that Microsoft turns out, is that art because it's glitched? Or? <laughs> that is an awesome question. Um, and and I, like, I think you should totally, you should write an article about that. Um, cause that's where we are right now. Um, that's sort of like, I guess, the front of the field. Um, and I, I can only speak personally to this because there's no official answer. Um, I think that it does have to do with inten intentionality, but not the intentionality of the author. I think it has to, uh, do with the intentionality of the re-presenter. Um, so like when I make a video, a, a glitch piece, like if I, in, when I make the status cycle, I, the status cycle is, like my work isn't really glitches because it's reproducible, it's safe to watch. It's really more like a recording of performance. Like I'm causing a file to glitch, saving that glitch, and then re-presenting it in a context. Um, so I'm, I'm saving something and then representing it as part of a movie 
and then presenting that to people. Um, so I think in the intentionality of saying, this is a glitch that I'm privileging, and I'm giving to you for your perusal or, or introspection, I think that's where glitch becomes glitch art. Um, it's a weird sort of like uh, Ouroboros kind of thing, um, because if a, if a glitch by definition is something which is unexpected, and art is something which is representable, or at least like documentable, or at least communicative, and communicative upon a parameters of expectation, like even happenings, even even like the most irreproducible things, um, you can still talk about them. You can still say, I was there, you can take pictures, you can document it, uh, you can communicate it somehow, and that communication is on an expectation, right? But a glitch can't be expected. So really, glitch and art are like magnets that can't ever fully go together. Um, but luckily, art is something that's representational. I mean, like, you know, I, I hate art and design. I hate it so much. Um, I love telepathy. The second we get telepathy, art is going away. Um, because, because think about it, like, the only, the only reason I make this stuff is so that I can put my thoughts in your brain. Um, and, and I think, like, when, when a good artist is someone who does that well. So if I can just do that like this, and you all get it, I don't need to worry about medium, media or anything like that. Um, but until that day, we're working in representational stuff. Like, I'm making a movie because I want you to think about these things. Um, so when I make a movie that has glitches in it, or about glit, or is about glitch, that's a weird statement. Uh, when I make that, it's really just to get you to think about it, even though the glitches that you see are mostly representational because they've been screen capped and saved and transcoded and put to DVD and watched, they're expected. But they're really the only way that you can address that sort of thing. Um, to go back to like the earlier paradigm, like talking about glitch and death, like if, if every time someone wanted you to think about dying, if they had to kill someone to do that, that would be a problem. Uh, and I do not encourage that. Uh, there's another question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, if glitch is expected, how do you address it? How, how do you communicate that it's a glitch in a way? I mean, I'm, I'm asking is not just art, but anything in the process of communication there is a glitch happening because we're not having a, tele a telepathic communication, so we are always in glitch, you know? That, again, great question. Um, and and one for which I don't have an awesome answer. Um, <laughs> I'll say I'll say that, um, okay, so I, I go, I'm still a filmmaker, and I go to a lot of filmmaker conferences, and they and there are people there that are from, like, the industry, and they they sit down, and they have, like, you know, the tech vest on, and they're like, this camera can, you know, shoot 444 native, and it pump, pumps out to an HDMI signal, and it gets the curious, you know, one of those things. And what they're all about is marginalizing any sort of interference, um, any, any sort of glitch, any sort of, as, as you put, like, mediated problem. Um, and what, what I think the glitch movement is about is either representationally or, or actually trying to push back um, and, and not say like every, you know, we should go back to like 1970 and all the video should be crappy and whatnot, but just say that we're never going to get to a point where things are perfect, ever. And, and to ignore the, the glitch or the, the mediated, you know, interference of the static doesn't have a say in what you do is crazy. Um, you know, like, I think like a really modernist perspective is like, I'm an artist because I have total mastery over my media, but I think that's crazy. I think a good artist nowadays knows how to work with the problems in their media. Like, I, I know that there are some things that After Effects can't do, um, and I work with that. I tailor my workflow to that. I, I try to understand. I try to listen to what the computer is telling me um, instead of just trying to like, punch it until it gives up, which I, I think a lot of people do. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's expected. Um, it, you know, when we got submissions for Glitch, like some, we'd ask for program notes, 
and sometimes the program notes would come in like weird ASCII formatting, and like you'd have to sit back and be like, is this? Did they want to do this, or did something screw up? <laughs> and it's it's really hard, man. It's really hard to figure out um, to 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 develop the context for the glitch. Um, which is which is why sort of my like my my thought on new glitch artists or young you know young upcomers is that you need to be super careful about your context um, and and not try like and and trust that you are going to have to define that context for yourself. I mean it's it's sort of uh, I think film had it easy where you could just be like film goes on a screen boom done I'm out you know like glitches are way more migratory they're way more transitory they exist in more spaces. And wherever they, you know, like, film purists will say, like, you know, watching a movie on DVD is different than watching it on film, is watching it different than on an iPod, which is true. I mean, it's, it's different. But uh, glitches, when they happen, really, really different, depending on your situation. Sometimes often illegal, depending on your situation. So, do your reading. <laughs> Are there other questions? At the moment, it it seems like uh, it seems like your understanding of glitch, the way that you're presenting uh, glitch to us, is a celebration of process. Totally, um, or it's a celebration of the process that normally gets neglected. Um, I, you know, I I can I can sort of jump ahead uh, a little bit. Um, so like last year, I I kind of like stumbled into a, an NSF grant. Uh, so the National Science Foundation was like, we don't understand what you do, but here's money. <laughs> Which is maybe like the best statement an academic can possibly hear. <laughs> but uh, so you all know Oak Ridge National Labs? Yeah. Yeah, they, up until recently they had the fastest supercomputer in the world, thanks China. Um, but yeah, they, they sold the fastest supercomputer in the States. And, um, and I got a grant to work on it and basically feed it glitches and just kind of see what happens. Um, and wanting a project, there was a movie that came out in 2002 called Dictasia. Um, that was a film by a guy named Bill Morrison. Totally awesome film. And he made it by taking nitrate film that had decayed and just represented it like as a, as a glitch, saying that like the decay was really pretty and really interesting. Um, so like the, the you know the 70 year process that the film took to decay. Now the archive that he worked with has recently you know in the past 10 years gotten digital um, in its preservation and are running all these problems trying to preserve this film because you know as you add another layer of preservation you're really adding another layer of interference because so not only did the film decay but now you're having glitches on top of that. Uh, so. What, what I started doing, and what I'm about to start doing actually really soon, is doing these performances where I log into the supercomputer remotely and pull down these archive files and then inter interrupt the download process and then basically glitch them live. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be kind of like truly celebrating the process because it is a performance, like I'm physically present when it happens. Which is terrifying to me because I'm so scared of performing. Uh, it's just not in my book. Um, but I figured like you gotta do stuff that scares you. Um, but yeah, like uh, this the supercomputer is an interesting beast because it runs a whole different set of parameters than, than this thing that I usually work on right here. Um, actually, funny story, uh, we crashed it <laughs> two weeks ago. Just flat out crashed the supercomputer. Um, with a program that we basically told 40,000 files to open up at once because we wanted to run basically, like, really simply a hex, a hex edit, like, probably what you've been doing. But on 40,000 files at once, the thing is, we're still running on hard drives that spin, and when you try to open up 40,000 files, they spin too fast and catch on fire. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a very interesting email from the, uh, the National Security, Security Agency. Um, because here's the other thing, don't name your thing glitch.py. Uh, they think it's a terrorist attack. So it's a learning process for everyone. But, but yeah, I mean, when I first started this project, I thought I was just going to make a movie, but then I realized, like, no, like, the process is so important. In fact, the process is kind of the only interesting part. Uh, at this point, like, 
you know, I've seen enough flip chart from kind of like, I know what you did to make that, I know what codecs you're using. Um, for me, it's all about the workflow and the context and who you've been reading. I, I totally, I'm totally a sucker slash snob, maybe? I don't know, hopefully not, for just like who people are reading when they're making glitches. Uh, right now I'm reading a lot of comic books. I'm making comic book glitches. I don't know how that's <laughs> Um, so yeah, so are there, are there other questions? I like these. These are great. Hey, I have a question, Evan. Yeah. Um, you, Barry was showing us where you can go in and open a photograph on the desktop and then change it to text. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, I can't quite hear you. Go ahead. Oh, can you hear me now? I think so. Okay. Okay, Barry showed us a technique where you could open a photograph um, and with text edit. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure you're familiar with that, correct? I'm aware, yes. Have you learned how to control that any, as far as reading any of that coding and... Uh, yes and no. Um, so, so, I don't believe this. When I was told, when I was a, a youngster, they told me that everyone's a unique snowflake. <laughs> the thing is, is files kind of are. Um, now, they, they run on a, a system, right, like, you know, uh, especially if you're looking at the hex code. I mean, the hex is basically, uh, you know, 8-bit color, color information for pixels. Now, depending on what file you're working with, uh, okay, every file has a header, the body of the file, and then a footer. Right. Um, and I think you probably may have realized right now, you can't really mess with the header and the footer because that's what tells the computer hey, I'm a file, this is my fileness, and then I'm done being a file. Right. If you screw at the top and the bottom, then you, the file most likely is vulnerable. Uh, now, certain files have really interesting uh, coding structures, and they, it sounds beautiful to say, like, uh, <laughs> delineated entropy encoding. I mean, I can't... It was a glitch. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it like stopped for a second. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, uh, Are you playing jump uh, man? Yeah. Uh, no, uh, yeah. So, uh, JPEG put up this thing called the Huffman Coding Index, which is actually a set of files at the very beginning. It's actually aligned between the header and the body. Um, so, this is my roundabout way of saying no. <laughs> These files are really, really complex, and they're meant for computers to interpret. Now, I love the idea of getting on a computer's terms and trying to like learn their language, because eventually they'll be our overlords. But until that day, I think that like looking at the file is just too much of our time. Like you would literally have to spend weeks with a file doing trial and error just to like get the amount of control that I think you're looking for. I mean, if I was another kind of person, I might say just glitch a couple versions of it, and then use Photoshop to compile them. But I didn't say that to you guys, because that's, that's being a little confused. I've certainly never done that all the time. Uh, back, Sweet. To this, back to this research grant that, yeah. that you were talking about. Uh, Can you stop me on that? sending instructions to this computer to open up files that are native to that computer. Uh, what, what else are you doing? Like, it sounds like... It sounds like the government's using you as an experiment to see where their weaknesses and vulnerabilities are. <laughs> Money. Um, okay, so there are certain parts of this project that I'm not allowed to talk about. <laughs> because I have a complete sellout, and, and when someone gives you a grant like this, you just kind of say yes. I'll tell you right now, I did turn down one of the grants they offered to design missile interfaces, because I didn't want to do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think they're interested in seeing like what corrupted data does to their system, but also what, um, yeah, I mean, like what, how resilient their system is to that. And I think like, you know, like we already pointed out a flaw, like, hey guys, maybe you should go to solid state drives that won't, you know, catch on fire. Um, but it, it's a pretty, it's a pretty secure thing. Like when I, when I got this gig, like I had, they gave me like a passcode that changed every 30 seconds and like, I have to sign away, like, I'll go to Gitmo if, like, you know, I sell their secrets or something. Um, but mostly I'm, I'm interested in creating, like, these art pieces with it. Um, so, you know, if they get some security tests and I get my footage, I'm sort of okay with it. So you're recording what you're doing as you're doing it, and they're, and they're allowing you to keep that, that recording? 
Uh, yeah, pretty much. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, there, I mean, they're, they're not deep, there's no military secrets on this thing. Um, and, and especially, like, a lot of stuff is lightened up because, you know, like, China just beat up, not by like, a little, but by, like, a crazy amount. Um, but, yeah, like, the electric bill for that thing is, like, a quarter of a million dollars a month. Oh, my God. Just for the computer. It's crazy. All right. <laughs> Um. What's on your phone? <laughs> yeah, I'm over there. Um. <laughs> I think we all have a question now. What's on your t shirt? Uh, hanging on a sec. That's a phone that never rings. <laughs> the NSA. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, I'm talking to you. <laughs> actually, did, I mean, I'm, I'm actually getting with Skype lunch right now. Can I come? Can I come down and see you in like 10 minutes? Alright, thank you so much. Bye. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, my shirt has a silent unicorn. Uh, I don't know what it is. Yeah, it's a silent unicorn. Yeah, silent unicorn. Yeah, silent unicorn. Yeah, silent unicorn. And it says, I'm fracking magical. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, do you have other questions, or should I, uh, I can talk about other things? You talked about the header, body, and footer. Um, is it as simple as swapping out the body of different types of files and keeping the header and, like, preserving the integrity of the file structure again? Yeah, you can totally do that. Um, the trick is, is knowing where the header ends and the footer begins. There's no, there's no obvious thing? No. Not unless you're a computer. Um. <laughs> like, let's, say, let's say you open, let's say you open uh, an image file in a hex editor. Um, there's not strings of, of two-digit numbers that you can recognize. Maybe? There are, there are on some files. Um, but like, like for example, with the JPEG thing that I was talking about, the Huffman, the Huffman coding characters change <laughs> with every file. Um, uh, you know, they change on width, they change on the amount of color density in it, like it's, it's crazy. Um, so you, you would have to study the file for a while. There's, there's at least no super duper easy answer that I found. Um, but, it, but at the same time, like, you know, this, this stuff changes so quickly that, you know, someone may have written a hex editor for this already that, that easily points out the header and footer for, um, you know, like at Glitch, at Glitch last year, like, I, I think the, the work of Glitch last year was, like, awesome, but then this year it was, like, so much better, like, stuff had just developed, because, you know, before before we kind of all got together as a community, everything was just, like, you know, oh, like, I wrote this script, here, I'll share it with you, but it kind of does this, but it does that, and you have to know, like, a little bit of Perl to use it, and, like, all this stuff, but now people have gotten so, even just in the past year, like, people have started making programs to Glitch things. Um, which is both cool and not cool, if you think about it. But whatever, you know. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's totally cool. What, I, I shouldn't be a jerk. Um, well, one thing that I will say is like, you know, normally, I've, so I've seen that the Glitch community is like super accepting of almost everything, but the one thing that I think everyone universally despises is data washing. <laughs> Which is such like a, a nonsense rivalry. Does everyone know what this is? Like data moshing? Have you heard about it? No, you, should, you should you should look up this video called Data Mosh by a, a rapper named Young Jake. Um, basically, like there's a there's a filter that you can run your files through that like it'll take out all the keyframes and it'll make all the pixels run together. And it's really beautiful. And a lot of artists that I really, like love and respect have used it like Nick Breeze and Takeshi Murata, like a lot of really interesting artists. But at this point, like, it's become sort of a filter. Uh, Kanye West used it a bunch. Uh, it was in a Coke ad, and, like, you know, it, it breaks what little heart I have to, like, see that. I mean, not really. Like, I'm glad, I'm glad people, because who knows, like, maybe someone will see that and be like, I need to read simulations by Beauregard right now for some reason. Like, it'll trigger something. Um... And if that happens, like, if one more person reads that book, great. But um, it's, it's tricky. Like, the thing that I've seen is sort of, like, do you want to, like, buy jeans for 80 bucks that are faded, or do you want to, like, fade your own jeans? I don't know. 
I don't want to be too much of a elitist. I'm trying not to be. It's hard. So yeah, do we have, do we have other other questions? Mm -hmm. What's the weather like in Knoxville? It's raining and I have a cold. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to your mohawk? I shaved it. Jeez, really? <laughs> that was, it me. looked awesome. Well, when I, I'm leading a class to Florence. We're going to do uh, new media travel hunts in Italy. And, and when I do that, I'm going to full shave it off. Excellent. And I'm going to get it to up here. Um, I can see so, that. So what about you guys? Have you been working on glitch projects? Anyone hit a, hit a roadblock that maybe I could sort of chat with you about? Well, we're, what we're working on now, Evan, is um, they're working on live performances for the final. Um, so we're using Maxim SP. Nice. And so we're playing with um, kind of glitch as an aesthetic. More nice. And, um, and through Max. Awesome. Well, I mean, like like I said, like, you know, glitch event, like, uh, we, we're aesthetic mediums. Like, we're always working as in aesthetics. So really, like, even, even like if I'm, you know, like the supercomputer stuff that I have, eventually when I export it and become safe, is an aesthetic. Um, so I don't think I don't I don't think you have to be like, well, I'm a glitch artist, but I work in Max. I think you should be like, I'm a glitch artist, but I work in Max. And you old it. Yeah, I mean, do, you know, if, if like if you're not if you're not an aesthetic, like what, like does anyone know what the opposite of aesthetic is? Politics. Politics. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's an aesthetic. How rad is it? Oh, there we go. Hey. You're still frozen. I'm still frozen here. I can restart my camera. Hey, tell him to go back to the bridge. <laughs> Back to the definition. Uh, the definition he was given because we didn't hear anything. Oh, okay. yeah. I'm interested in that. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, here we go. Am I back? Is this good? It's thinking. It's there you are. How is it? Now you're glitchy. What was it you said, Sean? Because we, we lost audio. I'd like to hear where he was going with the anesthetic. The definition, the definition of anesthetic. The definition of aesthetic. The opposite of aesthetics. Yeah, the opposite of aesthetics is anesthetic. Um, okay. Like, like Novocaine. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, as long as you're making things that like cause people to feel things or do things or think things, you're really always bringing an aesthetic, which means that every artist and scientist is working in an aesthetic. Um, yeah, there's there's no there's no shame in, in aesthetics. The other side of that too is like there, there's a bunch of artists again that I really like and respect, but their work is kind of boring because it's process based with with no reconciliation that they eventually have to make something that's optically or sonically interesting. Um, this is something that you'll see like not to hate on Brooklyn too much, but to hate on Brooklyn a little. Uh, you see that a lot up there in that scene where people are like, yeah, okay, so I took an Arduino and I mapped it through processing and it takes stock quotes every 15 seconds and then translates it to another picture of a Teletubby that I got randomly off Google. And you're like, so? Why did you do that? More importantly, why are you showing it to people? You know? So as long as you're willing to like make context for your max space widget, I think that's totally right on. I mean, just think about the space that you're performing in it. Right. Speaking on that point, um, uh, do you, your audience, who is your audience, and, and is it difficult for you to communicate what you want to communicate to them using this medium? Like, is it hard, is it hard for your audience to read what you're presenting? Maybe. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think, like, Compared to a lot of my colleagues in the glitch community, I think I make fairly accessible work because um, I still can't get away from like some semblance of narrative. Um, Henry Bergson would say that you can't ever get away from some semblance of narrative because you live life narratively, but I'll put that away for a moment. Um, I, I think that 
I try to make work that people can watch and then think about for a little while and then figure that maybe I want to go try this themselves or go read a couple books or like see a couple other pieces. Um, and I think I think that's what I want to do. Like I want to be a gateway glitch artist that like gets you into looking and reading into much more difficult things. Um, you know, personally, I, I, I don't like experiential stuff, or rather, like, I'm bad at experiential stuff because I don't have a soul or a heart or a conscience, I don't think. <laughs> so when I, like, when I see stuff that I'm supposed to watch for, like, 20 minutes and it's, like, just total glitches and you're supposed to get lost in it, I, I don't get lost in it. I get, um, I don't know, impeded. Um, but, 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 you know, I, I just feel like I haven't gotten to a point where I can appreciate that stuff fully yet. And, I, and that's a place I'd really like to get to. Um, so yeah, I, I make sort of narrative context that people can attach to, taking what they've already experienced and building off of that and saying like, oh, this is maybe how glitch as an aesthetic or an art form can apply to my life for my understandings of death or communication or love or, or passion or being apart from someone or latency or lag or cyborgs or whatever. Um, yeah. Any any other other questions? I can talk about the status cycle if you want. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so in 2007, I made a I made the first of what would be like ten a ten part series that I just finished this year. So that's that's been like five years. Um, and it's about it's this ten part series called the status cycle. And the word status refers to a type of tree that grows down in Central America. Um, now, the, it's, it's really hard to grow, but when it does grow, it's like insane. It, it's like the giving tree. Like, it regenerates really fast. People would build like houses out of it like year after year. Uh, they're, they're so important that like whole cities would spring up around them. Uh, in fact, two cities, one in Honduras and one in the Dominican Republic, were named after them. They're just La Ceva. Anyway, uh, they're so important that the Mesoamericans, uh, it found its way into the death bed. So they believe that when you die, you go to the status tree and you go up through its branches or go down through its roots, which sort of like everyone has that dichotomy, which, or not everyone, but it's, it's a pretty Western dichotomy and it's kind of uninteresting to me. But what's really interesting to me is that if you had a partner or a kid or like a reason you couldn't leave, you'd wait by the tree as, as like sort of a ghost. Um, and then you'd wait for your partner or your kid to come so that you didn't have to make the next journey alone. Um, and for me, that, that has everything to do, like that space of liminality, that space of entropy, where you're not, you're not gone, but you're not present, and you're not present, but you're not gone, like, that, that hit me right where I was living at that point. So I started exploring it, um, exploring how, like, bodies break down, how files break down, how archives break down, uh, and seeing that, like, when they break down, what, what okay, so, the word information is actually different than data. Because data is raw, and information is with context. Like, yeah, in a way it's like when you open up your the picture of a text editor, it's data. But when you open up as a picture, it's information because it's geared towards terms. Um, and and so, sort of for me is like, when, when a glitch happens to a body or to an archive or to a file or to a piece of media or, or to a city, it's like, a grenade and a respawn. Like it just puts everyone back to one. So I just made these pieces that were sort of about this, um, and they all sort of took different tacks. Like one's about traveling and how, you know, the, uh, what's it called? This T, uh, travel authority, the TSA. They, they want to like always watch you, but like their archives aren't very good, so like they can't actually watch everyone very well. And like another one is about it's like every everything I ever shot my whole life, uh, I put into a kind of a glitch blender and just put together what survived. Um, and it's it's all basically so that if you know it, it's the whole piece is an address of this person that's in the audience. It's always you know the, the second person you, um, and it's basically like how how to find me when I when I go to the same street because presumably. I'll pass that point of entropy, I'll look and sound, I'll, I'll be really different. Um, so, so in a way, like that, that's what the pieces are about. It's about 
learning learning to put away like our perception of totality and give into something that eventually will be incomplete because eventually we're all going to be so incomplete that we are not viable or, or dead. Um, so yeah, I, I, I made these pieces and then they, they played around and I, I got to kind of tour with them, which is super fun. Um, and eventually, you know, I'm still at the point where I hate looking at them at, at this point, but other people see cool them, so great. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't build the narrative and then glitch it. I make a bunch of glitches and then build the narrative. Yes. All right. Thank you. That's one thing. No, that, I love clarify. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you know, you know, it's just been five years. And I, I just, I like, I'm, I'm editing it together for this show in Portland that's like a, a single piece. And I'm sitting down and it's like, you know, who, like, I don't know if you guys know this, like, I'm, I'm 26 now. When I started this was 21, 21 year old Evan knew zero things. He was, and, um, and it's like amazing that he could even function to make this first. So it's like, not only are you looking at this, this piece, like a piece that you've seen a thousand times, but you're also like, wow, I sucked back then. And, and, and like, you know, I, I kind of, I mean, I, hopefully that's good because like, you know, if you constantly don't like your former self, you're going to keep refining yourself until you make yourself something you like. But, um, you know, and, and, and uh, anyone who tells you that anything, you know, everything that you make is autobiographical, so you go back and you look at it and you're like, oh man, did I really, did I really feel that way about that partner when I made that editing decision? Mm, I don't know. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of a horrible artistic time travel, but it must be done. <laughs> yeah. Wow, man, this is so, un man, this is like, this is therapy for me. <laughs> right? um, yeah. Um, other other questions? I mean, I, I have more I can say. You talked a little bit about things that you read. Do you feel like what you're into in your life really influences your work and how? Totally. Totally. Okay. Um, so I am a super duper, I love post-structuralism. Um, but I, I, I think you need to counteract. Okay, so post-structuralism, okay. So structuralism is like everything can be understood if you break it up into little pieces. Um, and it's, it's a really scientific understanding, which norm, which you think I'd love, right? But I don't love it, because it, it presumes that you can understand something fully, totally. That's crazy. Post-structuralism is sort of like, everything is still to be broken up into small bits, but you're never going to understand it. Um, and it, it's more about the reconciliation of that not possible understanding that I really like. So people that I really like reading are, are writers like Michelle Foucault, and Machine Baudrillard, who I actually think are horrible human beings, but their writing is really interesting. Um, more, more recently, uh, writers like Alexander Galloway, Donna Haraway, and Mackenzie Ward, I think are writing really interesting stuff. Uh, if you want stuff that is specific about glitches, uh, Glitch, the conference, just put out a book uh, called The Glitch Reader. And it's for free on our website as a PDF. So if you if you want to take a look at some of the writing, um, you can check it out. I mean, there's an amazing article in there by John Cates. Um, I wrote a, an article with an artist named Hannah Piper Burns called "Glitches Be Crazy," which is not very good compared to John Cates's article. You should read this first. You say it's called um, the, glitch, the Glitch Reader. The Glitch The Glitch Reader. It's all over the website. Um, yeah, it's it's sweet. It's a sweet thing. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, uh, but, but beyond that, like, there's other things, like, I feel like a bad glitch artist is just some, some of your reason about glitches, like, you need to read other things, like, I read a lot of magical realism, uh, like, uh, Haruki Murakami, uh, 
probably his work, but the Wind Up Bird Chronicle, I think, is like maybe one of the best books I've ever read. Uh, Sun Rusty, Kelly Link, oh my god, Kelly Link. Uh, go read some Kelly Link, as soon as you get to Barry's class. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Um, but yeah, just there are a lot of really interesting post-structuralist writers that are, are their whole project is tearing things down that we think are right, and, and showing why not only are they not right, but how we can't possibly know them. Um, like, like Foucault wrote this really interesting book called I Pierre Riviere after having killed my father, mother, and sister. Um, and it's, it's basically like, this guy kills his family, which we understand, and this is true, like this was a historical account in the 1700s in northern France, which we understand is bad, like you shouldn't, don't kill your family, um, having just gone through Thanksgiving. Um, but then he basically like historically re-deconstructs this to, by the end of the book you're kind of like, yeah, all right, kill your family, I guess, somehow. It, it's really strange, it's a really strange thing to, to think about like taking the social and, and structural norms that we understand and then turning them on their ear. But in a way, like that's where I find glitch to be like, you know, turning the thing that happens when you turn up your cable box and dismiss easily uh, to a thing that you privilege. So I'm all for privileging that which is often found dismissed. Other what's, your, what's your sound design class I saw that on Facebook. Really I can show you. Hang on one second. Okay. <laughs> He's going to show us sound. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a cat. <laughs> Okay. So, um, so there's this French sound theorist named Michel Chion, and Michel wrote this book uh, that was kind of like the, the book that we're reading for the class, um, and, and we started talking about like sonically interesting things, and we were like, you know what we need to do? We need to gather up in this dive bar in Knoxville and simulate the apocalypse sonically. So for an hour, we're having each student constructed like a three to five minute sound piece, and, and it's all like leading up to the apocalypse, then there's the apocalypse, and there's the aftermath, and it's all like chronically reconstructing it from the outside. So we, we are wearing these masks, the cult of Michelle Chion, and we are going to simulate the apocalypse. Um, and then there's a dubstep dance party afterwards. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's going to be really rad. Like at one point, all the lights in the building are going to get cut, and we're going to we have these military grade glow sticks that we're going to crack and like give to the audience. And um, yeah, there's some really interesting pieces out there that I'm, I'm really excited about. What are you having this? Well, tonight. 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 Oh. <laughs> it's it's our last day of classes, so we figured we we should go apocalyptic. Yeah. You guys are on your last day of classes? Yeah. Oh, wow. So, someone screwed up. We, st we started in like June, something that <laughs> But we started, we started really early. Uh oh. Uh oh. And you can see you. Oh, you can see us? Okay, you, you like, you, you froze. That's fine. Didn't he have a meeting to go to? No, I'm all frozen, like, the flash mob. <laughs> Well, are, are, there, are there any last questions before I go about Glitch or Glitch Art or the work I make or, or anything? Is there a way we could keep in like, touch or read something from you? <laughs> yeah, totally. I, um, I have a website that I'm pretty pretty up on. Uh, it's just evanbeanie.com. Uh-huh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I write something fairly big, I, I put it up there. Um, all my work, there's samples of all my work that's up there. Um, so you can take a look. And also my email and Facebook and all that stuff's up there. So, I mean, I'm, all, I'm always happy to like take a look at new glitch artists and what you're doing. Um, so if, if you're like making things, you want some like feedback or thoughts, then just someone to chat with.
That could be this guy. Awesome. Well, thank you, Evan. I think they need you downstairs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that literally, that phone has rung like one other time in my entire life. So, <laughs> you, that's an auspicious occasion. Uh, uh, thank you very much. This was great. No, Barry, thank you so much. Take care.